What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden back with the second video in our sports psychology series, this time looking at motivation, attention, and focus. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University, and in this sports psychology series from the essentials of strength training and conditioning, we'll be looking at motivation, attention, and focus. This is part two in the series, there's four parts, and this comes from chapter eight from, as I said, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. This was written by Statler and Dubois. The first concept to talk about here is motivation. Now there can be both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is the desire to be confident and self-determining. It's usually within the athlete already. It's instilled within them. You don't have to dangle a carrot in front of them. It's that inner drive. This type of athlete, this intrinsically motivated athlete, is a self-starter because of his or her love of the game. Now, extrinsic motivation comes from external sources, such as awards, social approval, or fear of punishment. So it can be a positive or a negative external motivation, right? The carrot or the stick. But these are things that are outside of the athlete that motivates him or her to achieve in sport. Now we also have what's called achievement motivation. This is, uh, this is a, like a type of external motivation that is intrinsically motivated. I don't know if that made sense. But it's the inner desire to have this outward social comparison or achievement, competition or social comparison. Whoever is higher in achievement motivation will be the better athlete because he or she has an appetite for competition. So this type of athlete just loves to compete. They love to see who's better or who's faster or who can best the other player. Often these types of athletes will compete in everything, not just their sport, but in a game of cards or in who can eat the most food at dinner or in who gets better grades. They just really, really like comparing themselves to others. Now, two key terms here to know, uh, mode, the motive to achieve success and the motive to avoid failure. So the first one, abbreviated as MAS, is the capacity to experience pride in one's self-accomplishments, and it's characterized by a desire to challenge oneself. This is usually looked at as a, as a positive thing. So the motive to achieve success is this, that type of athlete who's always looking for the challenge. They're, they're totally down for going up against that stronger or better team because they want the challenge. They want to be able to come from behind as an underdog. Now, the motive to avoid failure, this is, somewhat, this is seen somewhat as a negative uh, type of affect for an athlete because it's the desire to protect one's ego and self-esteem, and it's more about avoiding the perception of shame than about avoiding failure. So this athlete... Uh, is more shame driven, whereas the motive to achieve success type of athlete, they are challenge driven. So kind of two different sides of the same coin. Now, we know that there are some motivational aspects of learning. There are definitely ways to structure practice or strength and conditioning sessions in order to improve that motivation. So the first is self-controlled practice. This involves the athlete in decisions related to the practice structure. So this includes when to receive feedback and which skills to, pr to practice, and as well as asking athletes how they feel like they are doing. It can promote a more active involvement in the practice session and enhance feelings of competency and autonomy. So self-controlled practices really get the athlete involved in his or her training, and it gives them a sense of autonomy. It's kind of the same at, you know, any of you who are parents out there, you know that if you give your kids an option, they're more likely to obey. So uh, with my kids, I give them, you know, two or three options, but all of the options are good, and I let them choose, and then they feel like, oh, I've chosen what to do. Daddy didn't tell me what to do, but secretly, I've lined up those options for them because I know each of them are good. So as a coach, you can say, okay, do we want to do small-sided games today or conditioning drills? And they'll probably choose small-sided games, and then now they've chosen, and they felt like they had autonomy. But secretly, you as the coach know that they will get a great conditioning effect from that type of practice. Now, there's a few different categories of reinforcement you as the coach can use, and the first two are positive and negative reinforcement. And it's not that positive is good and negative is, is bad. It's that positive is adding something and negative is subtracting something. So you can add a good or a bad thing, or you can subtract a good or a bad thing. 
So positive reinforcement is the act of increasing the occurrence of a given behavior by following it with an action, object, or event, such as praise, decals on the helmet, prizes, awards, etc. Whereas negative reinforcement increases the probability of that action or that occurrence by removing an act, object, or event that is typically aversive. So in both of these cases, in the first positive reinforcement, we're adding something. We're adding decals on the helmet for every sack that you get, or an award for you know the most improved that season, or uh, we're adding maybe extra, I don't know, extra time in the massage tent for uh, the athlete with the best time that day. Negative reinforcement takes away things that the athletes don't like. So we take away the conditioning if the athletes perform sufficiently well in their practice that day, or if they hit certain velocity markers on their GPS data, then we're gonna remove the high velocity session that's following uh, you know, the next day because they already hit uh, those velocities and to encourage them to hit the velocities in practice or in the game or whatever it may be. Now we have positive and negative punishment. Now, positive and negative punishment is a way to sort of punish the athlete by either giving them something they don't like or removing something they do like. So positive punishment is the presentation of an act, object, or event following a behavior that could decrease the behavior's occurrence. So if the athlete talks back to you, they run a lap. If the athlete misses the pass, then they do push-ups, things like that. Negative punishment is the removal of something valued, such as privileges or playing time. So, you know, in this case, the athlete talks back and they're on the bench. Or if the athlete drops a pass, now they are demoted to second string, something like that. Coaches generally, this is general advice from sports psychologists, generally coaches should subscribe to a reinforcement strategy to assist athletes in focusing on what to do correctly. And this involves using reinforcement instead of punishment. Remember that reinforcement is the addition of something good or the removal of something bad. And that typically leads to better outcomes for athletes. And this is because punishment increases the likelihood that the athlete will focus on what he or she is doing incorrectly, not on the task relevant cues. Whereas positive reinforcement aids focus on the task relevant cues and punishment floods attentional capacity with the predominance of task irrelevant cues. So now the athlete's head is swimming with these doubts or anger or frustration or you know they're, they're focused on what they did wrong not on what they did right and so punishment should be used very sparingly now let's talk about attention and focus you know I just said attention to task relevant cues well the ability to focus attention on task relevant cues and to control distraction is a skill that can be learned that's important and that improves with increased experience so remember previously, in the previous video, we talked about how an increased level of experience or skill leads to uh, better performance at higher arousal levels. And now here we're seeing that we can learn to have better focus, better uh, attention to task relevant cues, and that this improves with experience. So we have a couple terms to go over. The first is attention. This is the process of both environmental and internal cues that come to the athlete's awareness. So the things you see and hear and feel and the physiological processes that rise to your conscious awareness as well, like uh, the feeling of fatigue, peripheral or central, or pain or, you know, and basically anything that comes to the athlete's awareness, this is their attention. Now selective attention is important because this is the ability to inhibit the awareness of some stimuli so ignoring the screaming fans, or maybe ignoring the pain that you're feeling to push through, ignoring the fatigue, ignoring the doubts. And, it, and by doing that, by drowning out your attention to those other stimuli, you can now focus on processing the task relevant stimuli. One way to do this is through a routine, the adoption of a ritual or a mental checklist of sorts that you do the same way each time you approach competition. So if you have your athletes develop their own routines, now they can start to focus. It's almost like a type of meditation, right? When you meditate, you're focusing your attention on a single point to the exclusion of everything else. And if any thought passes into your mind to distract you, you just acknowledge it and you let it move on. And then you re-center your focus on the breath or on the movement or whatever it is you're doing. 
the routine, the pre-competition routine is much the same because the athletes have this routine down. It becomes familiar, it becomes comforting, and they can allow their worry or their doubts or their outside distractions to enter their mind and just pass right out as they focus back on their routine and back on achieving the optimal level of arousal for them. The key point is that selective attention, which is commonly referred to as a level of focus, is the suppression of task irrelevant stimuli and thoughts. So here are the four sort of categories, the four quadrants of attention and focus. We have broad, which is uh, assessing and analyzing things around you. We have narrow, which is acting and preparing. This is what's in your control, right? Narrowly focused, you can act or you can prepare to act. We have internal, so this is analyze and prepare. This is like your thoughts, you're analyzing the situation and preparing, you're getting ready to act. And external, how are you going to affect the external environment by acting and by assessing that external environment? Okay, so there, there's not necessarily an order to the way that these happen. They're all sort of happening at once. You're, you're you know, analyzing uh, what's going on in your body. You're assessing the external environment. You're getting ready to act and you're acting. But as you act, you're analyzing the effects of that action and assessing what's happening on the, on the field, getting ready for your next action. So it's all kind of happening at once. Now that we understand ideas of focus and attention and also of stress and anxiety uh, that we talked about in the last video, now we're ready to start to tie those together with psychological techniques for improved sport performance. So that video will pop up somewhere on the screen. Click over there to keep learning through this series of four videos on sports psychology. If you had any questions though, let me know down in the comments. And as always, stay strong, move well, and be good. I'll see you guys in the next video will be a better athlete because he or sure because he or she has an athlete I can't talk today whoever has